Welcome to 2021. Uh, does anyone have their New Year's resolutions already written up? Raise your hand if you do. Any goals anybody has or things that they're thinking about for the new year? It seems inevitable that uh, one of the top ones that makes it onto everyone's list is exercise. Uh, specifically, maybe uh, someone is interested in riding their bike a little bit more. Doug and I were on a walk the other day and we saw one of our neighbors had two Swin bike boxes uh, by their garage can. So I was grateful that we actually didn't have to put any bikes together this year, but someone uh, did. Whether it's uh, leisure or competitive, if you are into bike riding, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever uh, thought about how your bike is tailor-made for connecting pieces to be able to go together? Uh, maybe not. Maybe you never thought about your bicycle that way. Uh, and maybe even more unlikely uh, is for you to think about the what-ifs. What if one of the pieces to your bike was missing? Maybe it was forgotten, maybe in the assembly process, whether it was put together uh, by somebody else or by you, uh, a piece was missing. But what if for some reason there was a piece missing? Maybe the front brakes were put on, but the rear brakes were not. Or what about the, the piece that goes together for the gears and the chain? I don't know exactly what that part is, but what if that part was missing? I know those go together somehow. Best case scenario, if a piece is missing, you just won't be able to get from point A to point B, or it might be terribly slow in the process. Worst case scenario would be an accident that would cause, uh, cause severe damage, depending on what piece was actually missing, like if your brake pad was missing, there'd be a problem. But no matter what scenario you might be able to cre create in your mind, a bike does not have, if it does not have all of its parts working, if it is not fully functioning as it intended, the bike's not going to perform like you wanted it to. A bike only operates properly when all of its parts are operating in tandem with one another. The Apostle Paul uses a similar analogy. He doesn't use the analogy of the bike, but the references still carry over when he describes the church. He uses the analogy of the body the body, the bride of Christ, which is actually what this gathering is today. It is the gathering of God's people. We are the vessel, the body through which God is ushering in the kingdom of God here on earth. And so we're going to dive into 1 Corinthians 12. If you have your Bibles with you uh, this morning, I'd like you to uh, open them up to 1 Corinthians 12. If it's not beside you, go ahead and leave the screen and go, go pick it up because we're going to read a bunch of the scriptures and it's easier sometimes to have that right in front of you. 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to start at verse 12 as well and go through 26. The human body has many parts, or some translations call it members. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body, one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts or members, not just one. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, then how would we hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, then how could we smell anything? But our bodies, physical bodies, 
the Apostle Paul is talking about, have many parts or members. And God has put them together, each part just as he wanted. How strange a body would look if only one part exists. Just imagine that for a moment, whatever body part it might be, if that was all that exists. He says, yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts, members of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those that are clothed with great care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require such special care. So God has put the body together, such with extra honor and care are given to those parts who have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. What we see here, or what I think we see here, is Paul describing a collective adhesiveness. There's a sticking together of parts to the whole body or to the members. This is what Paul is describing as the church. There's a partnership or membership occurring in this description that Paul gives us as you see the language that Paul uses. Even though there's not the explicit language of membership, it is inherently implied and assumed in the wording he uses. The book of Acts, which is the opening acts of the first disciples, were devoted to this concept of membership and partnership. It says they were devoted to the breaking of bread and the reading of their word and to each other, for they were sharing in all things. To be a part of the body or a member presupposes a commitment to one another, an accountability to one another. But more than anything, biblical membership implies a responsibility to one another. This is how the human body functions, is it not? If you looked at our own human bodies, and this is exactly how God designed the spiritual body of Christ to operate and function as well. The one another is so important to notice. And in membership, it's important to notice as well. Because membership is not tied to the brick and mortar Rather, it's tied to the living, breathing organism called the church. Much like a covenant of marriage is not tied to the first house that you ever lived in, but rather it's tied to the vow of commitment to one another, to a person. So it is with the church. Now, I'm not saying that membership is due till you die. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. Because God can lead us in and out of different expressions of the body, depending on the purpose that he has for you and for me, for the body, for that local expression. This commitment and responsibility, however, is to one anothering. This language of one anothering is not optional. It's so strong in the New Testament, in fact, that it's seen 59 times. If you had a chance to look through that information that I gave you in the book, I want you to pull out that list that I gave each person or each uh, family unit, the 59 one another's. Uh, one thing that I hope that we can do as a family here at our house is maybe to have this at each meal time and look over each one of those one another's. It's so fitting for this concept of membership this partnering, because it's what God desires the church to be like. 
And it's in total opposition. It's total opposite to what our culture views as membership. So I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas of what membership in our world today looks like. Let me know if any of them ring that you've heard them before. American Express, what's their slogan? Membership has its perks. Or what about raise your hand if you have triple A or AARP? Anybody wave your hand. You got one of those. There's all kinds of discounts, coupons, special price pricings, elite offers. Um, so my question is, when you signed up for the Gingrich's uh, membership covenant and you got your tithing envelope, uh, I'm sure each one of you got your special discount card, right? Or did, did was there a couple of you who maybe missed out on that? Um, if not, make sure you see me after the service. I wanna make sure you get one of those membership cards. But seriously, maybe we should consider something like that. Maybe our membership numbers would go up if we were handing out cards of elite offers. <laughs> well, what about Costco's or Amazon? Uh, if you pay an annual fee to them, you get awesome perks. You get free music, free videos, and the life-altering two-day delivery. I mean, you just cannot live without that. What about a country club? Is anybody a member of a country club? We have one right around the corner uh, to the church. In a country club, membership means you have private tea times. You have members only reservations to the country club restaurant and other entitlements that non-members do not get. We tend to think of membership as our rights, our benefits, perks and different levels and tiers you know like the platinum or the gold because this is what membership is marketed to us that it looks like so this morning i hate if i'm gonna burst your bubble uh, but the church does not offer any of these things <laughs> they do not offer any of these types of benefits Members and non-members alike get the same benefits. In fact, those who are members get what some would call as non-benefits or losses. We're actually called to lay down our rights. We're called to give out of our abundance. We're called to serve when we do not want to and when it is least convenient. We're called to be the last instead of the first. And then the last thing is we're called to bear with one another, which is quite possibly the hardest thing for us to do in the body. Shall I go on about all of the benefits that, that we have as a church? Instead of individual gold and platinum plans, according to maybe how fat our wallets are, we're given the list of 59 one another's. No wonder membership is confusing to us and people are not paying us to sign up for it. In Paul's description of how the church is to operate, Perhaps it would be better if we change the terminology to a covenant partnership so that we don't get confused with the worldly ways of how membership is used. But even then, it could be corrupted if we forget what Paul is getting at when he's using this analogy of the human body. It's that the church means it is less about I and it is more about we. Now, this does not diminish the concept of I, but be because to have a we means you have to have two eyes. <laughs> but it does mean that instead of saying, what's best for me? I think about my actions. I think about my attitudes and how those affect the whole, how we're interdependent. See, we were baptized into the church baptized into the church, into the body, the universal larger church of God to which Jesus Christ is the head of. But this is not in absence of a local expression of the larger church, i.e. Gingrich's here for us. 
For example, to redeem the worldly concept of membership that I just portrayed, I want to offer you this. If you sign up at the corporate office to uh, get a Costco's card and you send in your annual dues, but you never cash in at your shopping at the local Costco store, what was the point of joining anyways? When we are baptized, we enter into the family of God. Yes, the larger universal family of God, but also the tangible, the physical expression of the local church. How else are we to practice those one another's? Who else are we to walk with, walk out our faith with, and encourage one another as we serve, if not in the local expression? You can be a Christian and not a member or partner of a local expression, but you are missing out on so much when you are not. Membership today in North America is dwindling. This is a fact. In 2018, church membership was at its record low. Is this because the concept of membership has so much baggage associated with it? Is it because there are corrupt leaders? Or is it because the church is not speaking of relevant issues that people are struggling with? Is it because we don't have a handle on how to have grace and truth in the major cultural shifts that are occurring around us? Is it because the next generation does not feel welcome to walk the doors inside the doors of the church? Or are they not feeling valued in the church? I'm trying to ask these questions of myself as I interact with the next generation. And I've had the opportunity to talk with several people over my years and in my career of why this might be. Why are the numbers dwindling? And what I found was there are a lot of the things I just mentioned of why people are not coming into the church. We must come to grips with the fact that church membership in America continues to fall. Six out of 10 children raised in the church, six out of 10 children raised in the church have left the church. That's a whopping 59% of millennials, those who are in their 30s and 40s, who are not a part of the vehicle that God is using, the bike, the body, whatever analogy you want to use, to usher the kingdom of God in. And I'm wondering if that is alarming to any of us. No wonder the church is suffering as a whole. We are missing a major part of the body of Christ. Some have called this an epidemic and they're asking questions. Why are millennials leaving and abandoning the church? Not to mention, I didn't even mention the Gen Z generation, those after millennials. This is a question that I believe we need to wrestle with if we are going to be fully functioning members in a church. This is why I'm introducing this new series entitled, I Am a Church Member. I'm gleaning a lot of my concepts from the research and pastoral experience from Thomas Rayner, who wrote this book, I Am a Church Member. If you haven't had a chance yet to read the introduction and first chapter, I encourage you to do it. The chapters are super uh, short, so it won't take long to read. But what I want to be clear about is that although some thoughts and concepts are being gleaned from this book, our main thrust is rooted in a biblical concept of what it means to be a member of God's church. And today we're looking at a fully functioning member. If we are to be fully functioning as a church that has fully functioning members where all the parts are present, would it not suppose that we should wrestle with why are we missing a portion of the population? Why are churches today missing a portion of the population? I recently watched a video documenting uh, a little bit on this epidemic that people are calling of why millennials are leaving the church. It focused on the hunger that millennials have for spiritual things, for real life discipleship, 
and for space to relationally connect and participate in body life. And I want to share some of the thoughts that I gleaned, some of the things that they said about what they're looking for in the church. They're looking to see people walk in the fullness of who they are in Christ. And they see this being done with life on life discipleship, not head knowledge. That was literally what was said, not just head knowledge, but more, how can Jesus change my life in the everyday? They're saying, I'm willing to be open and being stretched and being uncomfortable. And they want others to do that as well. Being able to say, I don't have all the answers for everything, but I know who to go to. They're seeking a real relationship with leadership within the church. I could tell you countless times of how the church has been corrupted by leadership. Millennials are looking to be a part of leading and want authentic and transparency. They are hungry for it. And lastly, they are keenly aware of when the church is simply just asking them to join the system rather than join the church through relationships. Structure is good and important, but never at the expense of relationship. Nothing can take the place of good old fashioned, just talking through things. When I hear all of this about what millennials are saying, what teenagers and young adults are saying, the next generation is hungering for the reality and truth of God's presence in their lives. And they want to see it lived out in reality with the people they do church with. This is what they're seeking when they're exploring faith, when they're looking for a church, when they're looking for a family to join. They're looking for real life expressions of the person of Jesus Christ. They're not looking for religion. They're not looking for rituals. They're not looking for programs. They're looking for people who have an earnest desire to encounter Jesus and then help them encounter Jesus themselves. And I can tell you from what I see at Gingrich's, that is what membership is. It's one blind beggar helping another blind beggar to find their way to the king's table. And it can only be done through relationship, through partnership, membership to the whole body. It can only be done through one anothering. And so I want you to pull out, if you have it with you, Gingrich's Congregational Covenant. I'm sure you probably saw this before, and you might even get tired of it by the end of this series because we're going to be reviewing it each time we gather together because it is so important to know what are we committing to, who are we committing to, what is this commitment The first one is this, we intend to know and abide and follow Jesus Christ as individuals, as families, as a church. What we're saying is we're committing to developing intimacy with God and his people. The second thing that we are committing to when we sign up to be covenant members or covenant partners at Gingrich's is we intend to continue the transformation into the likeness of Christ. In particular, growing in wisdom, faith, faithfulness, courage, kindness, love, authenticity, and forgiveness. We are not perfect people. We're not claiming to be perfect people. We recognize this and we want to grow together. We want Christ to shine more. The third thing is we intend to be the body of Christ together. This interdependence, encouraging each other, sharing our gifts, our talents, which seems really ironically just like the first church in Acts. We have a responsibility to each other and to those that we do not know yet to show the love of Christ. Number four, we intend to be word-centered, recognizing that the scripture is our trustworthy authority and Jesus, our living teacher and guide. At Gingwis, we prioritize the written and living word of God. 
Jesus Christ is the revelation, the purest revelation of him. And number five, we intend to share Christ with the word, with the world by our words and actions. See, we give up our rights in order that others would be able to hear the best news ever. When you are asked to become a member at Gingrichs, this is what you're agreeing to. This is what you are committing to. There is no list of perks or privileges that come with membership. It's quite the opposite. There's more that we actually give away that when we, than what we receive because we all want to walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Christ in you. Biblical membership, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 12, is a partnership. We are able to be fully functioning parts of the whole. And when one member or part is missing, we feel it. There are areas of felt need in our congregation today, as well as all congregations Areas that at one time were filled, but now we have people leaving those positions. The baton is being passed to another. This can be seen a lot more in a congregation that is aging faster than it is growing young. And this does have some negative effects, as we've mentioned before. But this does not necessarily mean that those who are here are not fully functioning. It's quite the opposite. Many of you have given tirelessly of your time and gifts. And now you're looking to see what areas are better suited maybe for my life season. On the flip side, this does not take away the responsibility of those who have not yet found the place that is best for them to serve. To be fully functioning members according to a biblical model means that we are to know what our gift is and then we are to use it. We spent a whole series on that back in the fall about learning about the motivation of serving. But knowing and doing are two completely opposite things. Serving in the church is a lifelong thing. And I know that the members at Gingrich's can teach the next generation about that. But there's also a third area to examine which came up a little bit at our members meeting that we had when we talked about growing our children and youth ministry areas. And it also ties into the loss of millennials that we see churches facing today. When a part of the body is missing, there are negative effects because we're not functioning the way we were created to be. And when we see this happening, when we see that the bike is not working well, it serves us good to get off and do some examining, do some question seeking, maybe ask things like, what has been and what are the obstacles or hindrances to these ages participating or coming to our church body? What things do we need to do or change or be a little bit more comfortable in stretching with so that these members may partake in this family within our church. We should all be asking these questions of ourselves. And hopefully we are. Hopefully we're looking to the future, a vision of Gingrich's that has all of its members and all of its parts functioning well together. And as we do this together, I hope we continue to stay true to the foundational principle of membership, which is this, no matter what size church we are, no matter who we become during the vision process, no matter how many paid staff or unpaid staff we have, no matter what our average attendance is on a Sunday morning, we are all to be fully functioning church members. The reason for this is twofold, and it's in my conclusion that I challenge us together today to this. We are a priesthood of all believers, are we not? <laughs> Made up of many gifts that are to be used. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were not given to a select few, but they were given to the whole church. 
And whether those gifts lead to a paid or unpaid role in the church is really not the issue. The issue is we are to be using the gifts that we have been given. Are we fully functioning followers of Jesus? And in doing that, are we promoting this concept of an every member church? Now, the onus or duty for this kind of concept becoming a reality within our church body, it does not lay solely on the church leaders. It lies within each one of us. We are a priesthood of all believers. We can structure our churches or reflect this kind of concept in our body to minimize hierarchy and create a culture of encouraging gifts. We can do that and we should. But the responsibility lies within each one of us because we have the same Holy Spirit within us. The challenge is to remember that our gifts are not merely individually valued. They're collectively valued. When we choose to let our shape, I don't know if you remember that acronym back to our series that we talked about. When we choose to let our shape sit on the shelf, we not only hinder our growth, but we hinder the growth of the church. Your value is not just to yourself. It's to the church collectively. In a body, we are not independent. We are interdependent. For a human body or a bike to function properly, each piece must connect well with its adjoining parts. And as Paul says, and this is my conclusion here, this makes for a harmony among the members so that all the members care for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are honored. Would you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the grand design of the Bride of Christ. It was a part of your vision. It was a part of your planning. For us not just to be individually saved, but corporately saved as a body to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would continue to engulf us, continue to remind us, how do I serve properly? What are my gifts? What is my role? How do I interdependently work within the body? For this is how you're bringing the kingdom of God into the earth. I pray that you would continue to lead and guide us as a church as we do that. And Lord, I pray specifically for those who are not a part of our congregation yet, those who are not a part of the family. We ask for the harvest, Lord, to come. Prepare us for the harvest as it does come. We ask all these things in your precious name and the blood of Jesus. Amen.